Lord, I just want to come again uh, right now and just ask uh, for uh, your fresh anointing so that I can I can share your word with your people. So Lord, they're here to, to hear from you, uh, not from me. And I just pray that that would come across, that uh, they'd come away knowing the um, Lord spoke to me today. He spoke to me about some things uh, in my life and give me direction. He's, he's built me up or... Or, or he's dealt with some issues that I have. So, Lord, I just uh, pray that uh, by your Spirit, you speak to your people. Uh, anoint me afresh to, to do that, that their eyes would be focused on you and who you are and how amazing you are uh, to, to reach down from heaven uh, by your Spirit and, and touch a heart. And we pray that same thing for the kids down there. Uh, Lord, uh, just a lot of children... But you could you could reach them in a special way today. So I just pray you would do that through Joanne. Just anoint her fresh to, to just share your love with them. And they would just receive that. So uh, just thank you for what you're doing. Lord. Thank you for these different opportunities. Thank you for bringing the college students here that I could share uh, who you are with them in, in the Bible. So just pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, you have your... Uh, your outline and right away uh, we're going to get started um, trying to fill out the left side uh, the blanks um, today's message I, I titled um, come down to deliver and, and that will come uh, apparent as we, we get into the, the teaching today we're going to be in Exodus chapter 2 um, finishing up and then going into chapter 3. And the, the first question I would ask is, is what, what is sin? And so the Greek word for sin in, in the singular form is har harmatia. Harmatia. And uh, what that means is um, missing the mark. And, and it's interesting because, uh, like I said, we just entered bow season, right? So you picture this archer, and he's there, and he draws back, and he's got the target, and you've seen the targets with the, the circles and the bullseyes right in the middle, and, and he completely misses the target. He misses the mark, right? And, and that's what harmatia means, and so that's what sin is. It's missing the mark, okay? But it's, it's not just that, see, because... We can, we can hit the target. We can hit the 5 or the 10, but miss the bullseye in the middle. But that's what we're supposed to hit, is the bullseye in the middle. That, that's perfection. That's what God requires for us to hit. But you know what? We can't hit it. And sometimes you can hit it, right? But to, to make it to heaven, as far as God's law goes... You have to hit it every time. You can't, you can't miss the mark. Missing the mark is, is sin. And, and that's the picture that, that, that you need to see. And those that try and earn their salvation through keeping the law, they're going to miss the mark. Because the Bible says that if you, if you fail in, in one, you, you're, you're guilty of the whole thing. And that's, that's the whole idea. That's why the law was given. To show us that you can't keep the law. And therefore, if we can't keep the law, the requirement, right, the, the payment is, is what? Death, right? And, and not just, I'm going to die and be in the grave, but it's, it's eternal death, right? It's that eternal separation, that eternal punishment. There's the fire and brimstone. Not too much. Um, got in a conversation on Facebook about these things. I'm just making a joke. But, um, see, uh, and so the alternative, the only way that we can not have to pay that, that penalty, that price, is, is the cross. And it was fun to share that stuff with the college students uh, Thursday morning. And, and they could hear the difference. They, they could hear my, my love, my concern, sharing God's Word, uh, talking about these different issues, they could they could hear and see the difference, and I could see it in their eyes. They were receiving it, you know. 
And, and it was a divine appointment. So, God's bullseye is perfection, not just coming close. Now, whose mark is it? So what is sin? Missing the mark. Whose mark? Is it my mark? Is it me standing up in here and telling you what, what sin is? No. It's, it's God's mark. It's God's bullseye. He's the one that determines what's sin and what's not. Only He can. I, I'm a sinful person. I can't sit up here and, and tell you. I can only tell you what God's Word says. This is God's Word. This is what God says. And so if you're going to be upset about that, who are you really upset with? With God. Right? And, and that, that's nice for me because even though maybe some people might get upset with me, I, I know they're really not upset with me. They're, they're upset with God. And I can just keep sharing His Word and, and let God's Word you know, stand. I, I don't have to defend it. I don't have to explain it. Sometimes I, I get into that trap of doing that, I, and like we all do. I, I understand that. Now, God's mark, His, His perfect bullseye, are the Ten Commandments, but it's not just the Ten Commandments, right? I mean, there's, there's things in the Bible other than the Ten Commandments that God call, calls sin. Right? Uh, so, so many other things. And so, if, if you're confused about what sin is, which so many people are confused about what sin is today. So many people are confused about that. I would suggest that you take your Bible, and, and uh, some Bibles have accordances in the back, and, and, and find the word sin, and then follow all the scriptures that talk about it. And you'll get an idea of what God considers sin to be sin if you're confused about that that way you can see God's word for yourself and God can tell you what his what he says sin is right and so when I'm up here talking about different things there's not confusion and I won't be labeled as judgmental or condemning or, or, or hateful right because I'm, I'm not. Um, I'm not that way at all. Because I, I, know, I know where I've been. I know where I've come from. Many of you have heard my testimony. And so there's, there's no way I could stand up here and be judgmental like that. I can only say, hey, God says this is sin. This is going to hurt you. It's going to cause damage in your life. It's going to lead you not closer to God, but away from God and away from His presence. We were doing a study about um, being close to God. And when you're close to God, you're safe. So when you're close to the Lord, you're safe. So what's the opposite of that? When you're not close to the Lord, you're in danger. Right? You're, in, you're in danger of so many things. And, and that's what happens. As, as we sin, as we do those things, we, we know we're not supposed to do. God goes, okay, you're pulling away from me. And then He pulls away from you and He pulls His protection away from you so that you're all alone and you can feel the consequences of that. Right? And that's a scary place. That's not a safe place. And He does that for a reason. He does that so you won't be comfortable in your sin. I, I'm not comfortable in my sin. I know right away I'm not in the presence of the Lord. I'm in the presence of the enemy. And he can have his way with me. Or with my family. Or with my kids. And his influence will be the overriding influence. Not God and his presence and his word. Right? And that's a scary place to be. Now recently I reached out to people I love. And I'm not going to get into any detail here. But I, I reached out what I thought was in love. And maybe it wasn't perfect, but it was still a loving reach out to say, Hey, I'm a sinner like you, and I can't help you, and you need help. And this is the only one that can help you. 
and he helped me and, and I'm praying for you and that was the gist of it and because there was a certain sin involved which I wasn't judging I was just saying hey this is what God's word says about that and you were posting something that was saying uh, it was okay that, that Jesus didn't talk about that and didn't condemn that and so therefore you're doing it and it's okay and it was homosexuality. And so I, I just pointed out that, well, you know, Jesus is the Word of God. Jesus is the second person, you know, of the Trinity. He's the, Jesus is the one that inspired the prophets to talk about these things in the Old Testament. And therefore, Jesus did speak of these things. And He says it's unnatural, and it's abomination, and it's sin. Now, I didn't condemn, I didn't judge, I just said, hey, this, you're, you're wrong in what you're saying. This is sin, it's not natural, but God can help you with that. And I love you, and I'm praying for you. And what came back in my face was, you're hateful, you're so judgmental. I can't believe the hate that's coming across in your words. And I reread it, and I'm like, what? Right? And, and it was this person, that, and four people began to attack me. And the result of it was I was um, cussed at, called judgmental and hateful, and then I was disowned, unfriended. Right? And, and throughout, I kept you know, apologizing for the offense, but just saying, hey, I'm you know, just sharing God's Word, and, and you know, this is what the Bible says, and... and you know what the outcome of that was? Is that a, f a couple, maybe three of those, were acting like, maybe all four were acting like, I'm a Christian. Right? Maybe thinking that was the case. And as I began to expose and share what God's Word says, well, not everybody believes the way that you do. right? And I don't want to hear it. And as we're going to see as we go through the study, I think that causes a result to happen. And so that's what I want to look at. Jude chapter 1. There's only one chapter in Jude. So Jude chapter 1. Turn to Jude chapter... No, don't turn. It's on your outline. First on your outline on the right. Jude chapter 1 verse 22 says this. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. In other words, there are some situations where a gentle touch is needed to guide the lost, unsaved person or a backslidden Christian. To, to home to their father, to into the arms of a loving God who wants to, to help. Right? So sometimes a gentle touch, a loving word, right? A loving embrace. Hey, I love you. Right? But there is also a time we must uh, give them a firm rebuke, just like you would warn a child who's wandering towards the street, chasing after a ball, or, or whatever it is, when a car's coming. It's not going to be so gentle. It's not going to be so loving. I mean, you're going to be yelling and, and trying to save a life, right? You, you know what's coming. Jesus didn't always wash his children's feet. He also turned over some tables when it was necessary. The key is knowing when it's time to do it. We're in a real spiritual battle and sometimes we have to stand our ground and, and fight. Stand up for what's right. Stand up for, for God's Word and, and not bend. Even, even though some people might get hurt. Their feelings might get hurt. Right? 
what's more important? Someone's feelings getting hurt and maybe a couple of tears shedding? Or, or them going to hell not knowing? Right? Because when you share God's Word, God says, hey, my Word's not going to return void. It's going to accomplish what I've set it out to accomplish. And even though the reaction you get might not be the best one, you never know what God's going to use to save a life with that. As you're plowing the ground or cutting down trees or, you know, cutting a few branches away so that the light can shine in. The armor we are to put on is for attacking the enemy, not, not retreating. The armor isn't in the back, it's in the front. The breastplate, the, the helmet, the shield, right? the, the sword. It, it's, it's for a frontal attack and a, a pressing forward. Right? Now Ecclesiastes 3, 1 says, uh, To everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. Verse 8, A time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. Sometimes peace only comes after a, a battle. Obviously, keeping in mind, you can win the war, but, excuse me, you can win the battle but lose the war. I, I understand that. Uh, only God can, can win uh, the war. Okay, only God can bring the increase. So our battles need to be fought on our knees. On our knees, we're we're in a spiritual warfare battle, not not in, in the flesh. In our Christian walk as believers, uh, if we aren't on fire for the Lord, if we're not on fire, we'll be burning out. It's just, it's just the way it is, right? The the fire in your fireplace, it's it's either burning. Or it's, it's fading. It's cooling down. Okay? And the only way to, to keep it burning is to keep it stirred. Keep it stirred. Add fuel. Add, add wood to the fire. Right? Continually putting more wood on the fire to keep it going. Or it's going to cool off. And the fire will go out. And look around. At, at the people that you hang around with. Do they help your fire to stay lit? Or are they like water being poured on it? Extinguishing it. I think that can be the case a, a lot of times for us. Is, is that people we, we hang around with they're not really that good for us. And probably they're not good for us because we're not on fire for the Lord. And so, um, they're like water putting out our flame. It can be fun hanging around people who don't know the Lord. People are fun. God doesn't mind you having fun. Right? I have fun. Riding motorcycles, going hunting, uh, joking, laughing, uh, doing different things. Um, God's not a killjoy. People think God's a killjoy. He's not a killjoy. He wants you to have fun. And it, it can be fun hanging around people and those who know the Lord but don't want to know Him. Right? Yeah, I know the Lord, but I don't want to talk about Him. Don't, don't bring it up. Now the fun part for me is trying to win them to the Lord. That's the fun part for me. And because that's my goal, the things they do aren't tempting to me. I'm not tempted to do the things that they do. I can hang out with them and I can have fun and we can joke and we can laugh and we can do different things. See, I don't care if you do that, that's fine. And I'm not tempted to do that. 
because I'm on fire for the Lord. And I'm, I'm just trying to love on them, be their friend, not judge them, hang out with them. And, and God wants to convict them of that, that's fine. But I'm not going to be pulled into that. But, if my goal isn't to win them to Christ, but to let down my hair and be, be free from being a Christian, right? A lot of people want to be free from being a Christian for a little while. And so they go and hang out with, with people and they end up doing the things that they do and the influence is, is the other way around. Right? It's, it's opposite of, of what it should be. And then those people that they're hanging around are actually detrimental to them. They're like water and, and, and they're being poured out on the flame. And, and you, you know that's the case. Right? That, that's what happens. You, you know if you have children, you, you want to protect who they're hanging around. You, you know immediately, oh, they're, they're hanging around and, and they're starting to repeat these things and do these things and, you know, maybe I need to, I need to supervise their, their activity with them. So it, it's important for us, I think, as parents to, to protect our kids from, from being influenced by all these worldly things. But... Do we protect ourselves as well? And these things are like water and they, they, they quench the fire and it begins to go out if it hasn't already gone out. Remember I was talking about last time, Revelation chapter 3, and Jesus said, if you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Now I wonder how many Christians who are lukewarm in their walk with the Lord still think they have salvation in their back pocket. I wonder more about those who never really got fired up for the Lord if they ever really had it in the first place. You know what I mean? You can go to church and get a little bit of Jesus on you, right? And I've talked about that as a ball of clay, right? And you're the blue ball of clay, and you can get a little bit of red on you, you know, a little bit of the blood on you. And, and think that you, you got it in your back pocket and you're good to go. I'm, I'm good, right? And then I can go live my life however I want to. But when it really happens, that, that red permeates into the, the blue and it becomes another color, it becomes purple. And, and that becomes evident because the change starts to take place in your life. And you're not perfect, but you're moving towards um, being not sinless, but sinning less. Not, not, not staying the same or sinning more, but, but moving in this direction as God begins to go, hey, I want to I get this out of your life. I, I want to trim that branch right there. God doesn't trim the whole tree and shock it to death, right? He doesn't do that. He lovingly points out and goes, hey, I want to work on this right here. Right? And that's what He does. And that's going to be the process. That's going to be, you're going to look at your life and go, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm moving in this direction. Not, not sinless perfection. That's not what I'm talk about, talking about. I believe that being lukewarm is probably the most dangerous place you can be as a Christian. The false reality is that you're okay as you live, live your life any way you want. And the book of Judges is full of stories where God's people whom He delivered out of Egypt did what was right in their own eyes. But it didn't go too well for them after that. When we do what's right in our own eyes, when we, kinda, when we don't look at God's Word and we go, that's not so bad. Right? And I talked about the, our eyes start to get blurred. Right? Because of little compromises. And then all of a sudden, the, the black and the whites merge into another color, right? 
gray. Everything, that's a gray area. That's a gray area. When maybe you look at the Bible and go, that's not so much of a gray area, right? And things like that. So, let, let's look at Exodus chapter 2, verse 11. Maybe before that, let's look at your outline. And the third question, you can just, you can either mark it or think about it. What condition is your fire? Is it hot? Is it cold? Is it lukewarm? And as a Christian, it needs to be hot. And you need, you need to do whatever that takes to, to stoke the fire, to rekindle it, and, and get that fire hot. And, and obviously, it's never too late to do that, right? So, here's, here's Moses, okay? He's been born of, of uh, these two Levite um, people, Amram and, and Jochebed. And, and God, God saves him from, from being drowned in the Nile, right? Jochebed um, fears the Lord. She doesn't fear Pharaoh's edict to, to kill the firstborn male child. Not firstborn, but the male children. She doesn't do that. She hides him three months, uh, but then she can't hide him any longer. So she makes a little ark, you know, a little boat, pitches it, and, and she puts it uh, at the riverbank uh, among the reeds. Probably knowing uh, this is where Pharaoh's daughter comes and, and, and bathes, right? And Pharaoh's daughter comes and finds it, and then little Miriam comes along, hey, I can... I can find you a, a nursemaid, you know? and and so the Pharaoh's daughter says, "Hey, yeah, I'll pay you. Go, 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 and do that." And so, uh, Jochebed even gets to raise little Moses in her own house and get paid for it, and, and teach him, you know, about the Lord. And we looked at that last Sunday. So, so then Moses grows up. And Forty years later, he he's a, an adult male, uh, and most likely he's. You, you look at the historical documents and the things like that and who this, this woman was, Pharaoh's daughter, and, and, and so on, and, and, and what Josephus says, and, and it looks like Moses was even in the, the, the position to even become the next Pharaoh, you know, and, and that he, he led a, an army assault to the Ethiopian. And, and you look at those things, and, and he was wise in the ways of the Egyptians, and, and knowledge, and building, and, and language, and math, and things like that. And so, what's tricky for those who are on fire for the Lord, opposite of being cold or lukewarm, is we must be careful about this passion that we oftentimes feel for the work of God. I, I can be passionate for the work of God, and, and I can get ahead of God. And, and I can be operating in my, in my flesh without His anointing, without His leading, like, like Moses did with the, the Egyptian soul, right? Uh, he, he went out to visit his brothers, and, and he saw one of the Hebrews being abused by an Egyptian, and, and he got ahead of God, and he killed the Egyptian. Now, there, there was nothing wrong with um, preventing the beating right, of, of one of his brothers. But the, the work of the Spirit can never be accomplished in the ability of my flesh. That would be the, the fourth one on your outline. The work of the Spirit can never be accomplished in the ability of my flesh. To do the work of the Spirit, I must be anointed, empowered, directed by the Spirit of God. And so many of my problems have risen from the same mistake that Moses made. Having a, a consciousness of what God wants to do, having awareness of the purpose of God in my life, I try to fulfill the purpose of God without 
the leading and direction and the help of the Holy Spirit. So I get ahead of God. And every time I do, I botch things up. And then I have to hide the body. Because <laughs> I'm a lion. And a lion seeks, okay, who do I got to kill to get this thing done? And then the beaver comes along and I got to hide this body. And that was a fun little thing we did one Wednesday night. So some of you are like, okay, who's he going to kill? <laughs> Nobody. So Moses' attempt was premature. And he, and he got ahead of God. Now, Acts chapter 7, uh, verse 23 through 25 on your outline on the right, it says, um, Stephen, you know, he, he's the first Christian martyr okay, who died for his faith. Stephen recamped um, what Moses was, was going through. And it says, now when he was uh, 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit, visit his brethren the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended and, and avenged him who, who was oppressed. And he struck down the Egyptian. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand. But they didn't, they didn't understand. Now, if Moses or you or I were to sit down and come up with a plan on how I'm going to deliver my people, right? Moses felt this, this call in his life as a deliverer of his people. He was in that position of authority. So, I don't think it would be this way, right? My brother Aaron and I are going to go to Pharaoh with a special stick that's going to turn into a snake. And we're going to say, let my people go. right? And if he doesn't, then we're going to turn the Nile to blood. We're going to bring all these plagues finishing with darkness over the land. And if that doesn't work, then we're going to kill the firstborn. And we're going to flee from Pharaoh with all the gold and riches of, of Egypt. And we're going to get to the Red Sea, and it's going to part. And we're going to go through, and then Pharaoh's going to pursue, and, and it's going to close in and, and kill all the army. And then we'll make our way to Canaan, to the, the wilderness. Okay? I wouldn't sit down and think of that, right? I would go, how can I... Right? Kill one Egyptian at a time. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. So, th that's how we think. We, we do things in our way, but, but God's ways are not our ways. Okay? God's thoughts are, are not our thoughts. And He's going to do something in such a way that is going to deal with the Egyptians and, and their false gods and show it to the rest of the world that, that the God of the Jews is the one true living God. And He's going to deliver a people in such a miraculous way as He's going to bring them into the land. And the people are going to be afraid. Remember Jericho? Rahab says, man, we're, we're, we're so afraid. We, we know that God's with you and He's giving you this land. Now Moses had no idea at the time when he was still an Egyptian, you know, in, in, in the, the family of Pharaoh. But he was too big for God to use. Now just like Jesus, Moses could not deliver his people when he lived in the palaces of, of glory. He had to come down off the throne away from the palace, into a humble place before He could deliver His people. And that's exactly what, what God did. Exodus chapter 2, um, 15 through 19, talks about Moses fleeing after this incident. And he, and he goes to uh, Midian. And... I pointed out, I think, uh, on the map last Sunday where Midian was. It was on the, the other side of the... Um, what's it called? It's the Red Sea, but it's a certain part of the Red Sea. 
I don't think it's the Sinai Peninsula, but it's the Gulf of Aqaba. Aqaba. So it's on the other side of the Gulf of Aqaba, from the Sinai Desert there. It's on the other side. It's actually in Arabia. So Midian is actually in Arabia. And that's why Paul says Sinai of Arabia. Mount Sinai is not in the little bottom part of, of the two you know, fingers of the Red Sea. It's over here in Arabia. Right. And um, you can see that in the, the movie we had, Mountain of Fire. Okay. So fascinating find. Anyway, Moses flees to Midian. He, he comes to uh, this well, and there's the, the daughters of, of Jethro. And It says that Jethro was the, the priest of Midian. And uh, most likely, um, you, you find in Genesis chapter 25, when Sarah died, Abraham married Keturah, and they began to have children over here, uh, and, and one of them is Midian. And so most likely, he was a descendant of uh, Abraham through Keturah. And quite possibly, he was a, a priest um, worshiping... Um, Abraham's God. It's very possible that that was passed down uh, through them. So God led Moses to this specific family at, at a specific time. And just as He's led you to uh, specific people in your life at specific times. And I can look back and see God has led me to this place. And I can see that so clearly. I can see the little road maps and the road marks and the, and the little detours and, and that God was leading me to this place and to this person. So hindsight is twenty twenty a lot of times. But when you're in the moment, it's not always that clear. And that's why it's so important in the moment to be praying. Is this where I'm supposed to be? Is this who I'm supposed to be with? Is God telling you in His, in his prayers in your prayers and, and through His Word, right? Is He speaking to you? And that, that's very important to, to be led by the Lord because we can be so easily led astray by our emotions, by our loneliness, by our needs, right? And so confirmation through God's Word, uh, through prayer, Now, the years that, that Moses waited in Midian, um, those were working years. Moses never worked this hard in his life. He grew up in, in the house of Pharaoh, right? The, the maids and the servants and, and the different things. So he's, he's on the backside of the desert raising sheep, working out there in the heat, you know, sweating. And so... It really wasn't, he's, he's on the shelf. God's actually molding and, and shaping Moses through this mediocre task of, of raising sheep. And it's not even his sheep, right? You guys aren't my sheep. You're, you're, you're God's sheep. And I'm just leading you to the the, the water and, and to the pasture where the, you know, the, the food is and, and sharing you know, God's the, the food, the nourishment to you. Now 23 through, through 25 it says, Now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. Now... Um, We looked at the timeline, and, and I think this is very simple. Um, one of the Wednesdays we looked at this timeline and went through all these scriptures and, and gave you a breakdown of the timeline. We talked about this a little bit last Sunday, I think. But um, one of the key verses is uh, 1 Kings chapter 6, uh, verse 1. 1 Kings 6, 1. And it says, 480 years after 
the children of Israel came out of Egypt. Solomon, in the fourth year of his reign, began to build the temple. That gives you a landmark in history. When to count back to a date when the Exodus took place. And so many people get it wrong because they don't go to that verse and that scripture, which is God's Word, and get that date. We know by history, by historians, when that date is that Solomon began to reign and when the fourth year of his reign was. Solomon began to reign in 970 B.C. The fourth year of his reign, therefore, is 966 B.C. So 480 years, take your calculator out, add 480 years because you're going to be adding, you're not going to be subtracting because you're going back, your, your numbers are going to get bigger. And you come to the date of 1446 B.C. That's the day that the children of Israel came out of Egypt. Period. Right there. And if that date is wrong in any chronology you come across, it doesn't matter if it's the chronology Bible or, or somebody else's timeline, if that date is wrong, it's wrong. Okay? You use history. We, we know the, the date back in history when that took place. We know when King David was on the throne, 1000 B.C. We know when Solomon began to reign. We know when the temple was began to build. We know the, the, the years until the, um, the destruction and the, uh, the dispersing of the children of Israel into Babylon. All those things mash up. And, and there it is, 1446 B.C. And so if that's the date of the Exodus, 1446 B.C., then they wandered around for 40 years, right? And so that means Joshua took over 40 years later. So now you're going back down to uh, 1440. And that's when he came in and conquered Jericho and Ai and, and the other one, I forget the name of it. And archaeology, digging in those areas, date the time of their destruction to the 1400s. Right there. So archaeology lines up with the timeline. Um, the Bible lines up with the timeline. And it's all right there. And you'll see it in the in the film and the evidence. And and you'll you'll see why they get it off and why they're wrong with their timelines. And chronology Bibles and, and different people, they're not the word of God. They're human people like you and me that make mistakes. Right? But this is God's inspired word right here. This isn't a mistake. And history gives certain dates that, that aren't a mistake either. Now people who um, try and go back a long time and do a timeline without taking these things in consideration, then you start to make mistakes. Anyway, I'm getting off a little bit there. So, most likely, the I was the Pharaoh when Moses was born. the I. The daughter of the I was Hetzepsit. Most likely, Hetzepsit. Not picks up it. Hepsets it was the daughter that found Moses, took him in, raised him in her home. And she was married to Cutmos the second, but he died early on. And there was another Tutmos the third that most likely is the, the Pharaoh of the oppression. And this is the Pharaoh of the oppression that died in 1450 BC. Six years before, four years before the Exodus. Because it says, now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. Tutmos III died. The one who wanted to kill Moses when he killed the Egyptian. And, and history says that, that he was actually the, um, the stepson of uh, Hetzepseth. And she co-reigned with him for a season. And then when, when he raised up to, to power, he began to wipe out all the evidence of her among the monuments and things like that. 
which, which they would do, uh, ones that came into authority, they would begin to, to erase. You know, that's why it's so hard sometimes to, like the Hyksos um, that were in power. Uh, their, their memory was, was then wiped out. These shepherds, these Aes, um, you know what I'm talking about? Hyksos. Uh, they came into Egypt. Um, maybe they were the ones that were in power when, when Joseph came. And, and Joseph had favor you know, with Pharaoh. You know, a fellow, a, a fellow uh, shepherd people, and, and so things like that. But they would wipe wipe out that evidence. Anyway, um, it says uh, in Exodus chapter two twenty three through twenty five. Then the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage, and they cried out, and and their cry came up to God because of the bondage. And so God heard their groaning. God remembered His covenant with Abraham and Isaac and with Jacob, and God looked upon the children of Israel. And God acknowledged them. Now, God hadn't forgot about His people. He laid out a specific time that they would be in Egypt. And the, the purpose of that was that the sin of the land of Canaan hadn't reached its fullness yet for judgment. So He was waiting. And it wasn't complete yet. And so the same is true for you. There is a specific amount of time laid out to accomplish what the Lord desires to accomplish in your life and in my life. So Exodus chapter 3. Now Moses was pastoring the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of the bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burned up. So the burning bush not being consumed was a a magnetic sight to Moses. It was drawing him like a magnet. It drew him for a closer examination. And some say the burning bush here is a picture of God's uh, grace that draws us to Him. In this picture of, of the bush uh, being a, of God's grace, you, you have a thorn bush. The original Hebrew word comes from the word to stick or to prick. Okay. So this was a, a thorn bush or a bramble, and which is a figure of the curse back in Genesis chapter 3. Remember, Adam was, was cursed to bring forth thorns and, and thistles. He, was, he worked in the garden before the fall, but now he's going to have to work extra hard to realize less, right? And there's going to be thorns and thistles. And, and what was the crown that Jesus wore when He went to the cross? A picture of the curse. The, 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 the crown of thorns. right? A, a picture of that curse back in the garden. As, as uh, the, the second Adam you know, put the crown of the curse on His head. Right? So the curse is burned. A picture of judgment. Right? Uh, without being consumed, therefore a picture of God's mercy and grace. So there, there's uh, the picture that some say it, it, it paints for us. Now here's what I, what I want you to see right here in, in 4 through 6. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the, of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not draw near to this place. Take your sandals off your feet. But the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the, the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Here's what I want you to see. When the Lord saw that he turned, you see that? God didn't speak to Moses until he had Moses' attention. There was the flaming fire in the bush. It wasn't being consumed. And Moses turned 
and looked and he went forward to see and God spoke to him. When does the Lord speak to us? When we give Him our attention. When we draw close to Him. Oftentimes, God's Word doesn't touch our heart the way that it should because we don't give it our attention. The burning bush was a spectacular phenomenon that captured Moses' attention, but it changed nothing until Moses received the Word of God there. Signs and wonders can, can get your attention. But it's, it's the Word of God that you receive that, that does the changing. So a question. Are you giving God your attention? It's a, a yes or a no. Are you giving God your attention? So you can receive His Word. Or is it a, a half-hearted attention? Or are you distracted? Are things distracting you? Whatever the heart genuinely seeks, it will find. Jeremiah told the people to seek God with all their heart and He would be found. You can't seek God with a half-hearted effort and expect to, to really find Him. You know what I mean? The one who pursues righteousness will find it just as evil will come to the one who searches after it. Proverbs 11.27 As it is written, those who worship worthless idols forsake the love that could be theirs. And that's really what the Hebrew words mean in, in Jonah chapter 2 verse 8. They, they forsake the love that could be theirs because we worship worthless idols. We, we go after worthless things. And in the end, those worthless things actually are, are the water that pours out onto our fire and quenches it. And, and make us lukewarm. David understood that as he pursued God, God's love would pursue him. As we seek, we are sought by God. As we draw near to God, so He will draw near to us. James 4.8 says. The prophet Hosea likewise cries out, Let us know, let us press on to know. And, and it's, it's the, the Hebrew word means pursue after the Lord. Uh, His going out is sure as the dawn. He will come to us as the showers, as the spring rains that water the earth. The, the Word of God is, is likened to water, right? And it's that water that... That waters the earth. Now, when, when Samuel was a young boy, okay, little Samuel, you remember the story in, in 1 Samuel... He heard the Lord call out to him. That's just the enemy trying to distract you guys from hearing the word. Don't let it. Focus in. Press in. Pursue after. Right? He heard the Lord call out to him. So little Samuel, he's dedicated to the Lord by his mother Hannah, who couldn't have kids. She's at the temple. She's crying out to the Lord for kids. God answers her prayer. She says, I'm going to dedicate this little boy to you. Right? And then when it came time to dedicate little Samuel, she brought him to the temple, and there's Eli. Eli takes him in, and, and there's Samuel, sleeping inside the temple where the menorah was and the showbread, and there's the, the veil and the Holy of Holies. And this is in a place called Shiloh, which is the first um, out of the wilderness wanderings, you know, not the tent, anymore. Maybe it was a tent, but it had a foundation. I've been there in Israel, and you can still see the foundation stones. It's amazing. They're in Shiloh. We had to take an armored bus in there because it's in the Gaza Strip area. Right? So we had to take an armored bus. But we got to walk out through this field and come to where the temple was. 
where, where Samuel was and Eli. It was amazing to see that. And so there's Samuel sleeping inside the temple and he hears a, a voice, Samuel, Samuel, just like Moses in the burning bush, Moses, Moses. And, and Samuel doesn't know the Lord yet. And so he gets up and he goes over to Eli, 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 lama sabat, no. He said, Eli, um, no, he's the Eli. Eli, did you, here I am, did you call me? Right? And I go back to bed, go back to bed, right? Now, Eli couldn't discern that it was the Lord speaking because it had been so long since, the, since he heard the Lord. And you see that on the scripture I gave you, 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1. Now the young man Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. Why? Why, why was that the case? And you find out why that was the case in chapter 2. Because Eli had two sons who could care less about the Lord. They didn't know the Lord, but they were operating as priests, and they were just out for themselves, like a many, many pastors out there, just uh, wanting to get money from the people, you know, taking the offerings. They would, they would stick in the, the fork and pull out the meat, and that's how the, the priests were supposed to get their portion. And, but they would say, no, uh, give me the meat before you stick it in. Uh, yeah, don't burn it. I want, I want, I want the choice meat. You know, and if you don't give it to me, I'm going to take it by force. And so they were doing these things. And, and Eli rebuked them, but he didn't really do anything about it. And there was a compromise there. And what happens when we compromise? Remember, our eyesight begins to blur and, and we, we can't see so clearly anymore. And we see that Eli, his eyesight was going bad. And it says that... Um, that the word of the Lord wasn't heard. It was rare in those days. And so there's Eli, compromised, not dealing with the sin of his sons, the priest of, of the, the tabernacle, Samuel, the next generation coming, hearing a word from the Lord. God wants to reach out to this next generation. And he comes to Eli, and Eli says, go back to bed. Go back to bed. How often the Lord wants to speak to the next generation and do a, a new work of the Holy Spirit. But a lot of times the Eli's say, go back to bed. Finally he discerned and said, ah, oh, I think the Lord's speaking to you. Go and say your servant listen, right? So important. That we give God our attention so that, that we can hear Him speak to us. And I put another question there. Can you hear Him speaking to you? Can you hear Him speaking to you? And if so, what's He telling you? Because the Lord's going to tell you something. What's He telling you? Maybe He's telling you to do something. Go speak to somebody. Maybe He's telling you to deal with something in your life. Deal with that. And oftentimes, that's the only thing we hear time after time after time. For me, it was... Right? When I came back to the Lord, rededicated my life, what I kept hearing was, you need to quit smoking pot. <laughs> I kept hearing that, kept hearing that, kept hearing that. And though finally, I did. But he, he took it away from me. He had to take it away from me. And then he gave me something new. It's like with Jonah, go to Nineveh, then comes the fish, and then what was it after the fish? Okay, go to Nineveh. Okay. Go do that thing I told you to do. Okay. We want A, B, and C, but He only gives us A, and then He'll give us B when we do A. And then when we do B, He'll give us C. Okay. So God's first words to Moses was to call him by name. Moses wasn't forgotten. 
and, and you're not for God. And God knows right where you are. He, he knows where you've been. He knows your name. And, and He cares right now. Back to this story at the beginning I was telling you, and, and we'll wrap this up. I apologize for, for getting on here again. Genesis, uh, excuse me, Exodus chapter one, um, 3, 7 through 10. God explains His general plan to Moses. And Moses' plan, place in the plan, excuse me. Moses' place in the plan. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. And I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me. I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come now, therefore, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. So first of all, okay, the Lord says, I have surely seen the oppression of my people. God sees the oppression of His people. He sees what you're going through. He sees what I'm going through. He's not blind to it. But He has a time he has a time and a purpose for it. We so often feel that we are all alone in our suffering. Nobody really sees. Nobody really knows. Nobody really cares. But God sees. And not only that, the Lord hears your cries. The psalm says that He, he saves your tears in a bottle. Because they're precious to Him. He saves them in a bottle. Most likely that was what um, the woman came to wash Jesus' feet with her tears. She had a bottle of tears that she poured out on His feet to wash them. And then dry with her hair. You come to me with your trials and with your problems and with your situations. And I say, I hear you. I hear you. Okay? Uh, I see what you're going through and I, I know it's tough. But that's about all I can do. I can give you a hug. I can pray for you. But that's about all I can do. I can share some scriptures with you. Try and, try and give you hope. Try and, try and help you on your feet. You know? I don't have the solution. I can't do anything. I'm totally helpless to change your situation. I can't heal my wife's cancer. I can't. I'm totally helpless to her situation. I can't take away the pain she feels, the loneliness she has in her suffering, lying on her bed, unable to get up. I'm helpless. But this is where the Lord comes in and He says in Exodus chapter 3, verse 8, I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. And that's why, that's what I said to this person back here at the beginning of the message. I can't help you, but God can. I can't help you. And a lot of us are trying to help people, but we, we can't really help them. We can stick a band-aid on their situation. And that's really all it is. It's a band-aid. Only God can help them. Only God can save them and change who they are, what they're going through, their struggles, the cancers. But 
But sometimes they don't want to hear that. Right? They, they don't want a new covenant with the Lord. They want to do what's right in their own eyes. But God doesn't just see and hear and know what you're going through. His desire is to deliver you from your bondage, from your slavery, from your situation. The cross. Look at the last set of verses. And it answers the question, when did God come, to, come down to deliver us? Philippians 2.7 says, speaking of, of Jesus, but He made Himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, He humbled Himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. So, God comes down to deliver and He's the only one that can do it. And my help for you is, is only a band-aid. Or your help for somebody else is only a band-aid. What we have to do is we have to lead them to the one who can help them. And if they don't want that help, then it gets to the point where you, you kind of wash your hands of it and go, okay, I, I love you and I'll pray for you. But you have to, you have to be on fire. And you can't let people in your life that are going to pour water on your fire if you're not strong enough to resist that pouring. Until you're able to not let that affect you and then you're able to stand with, with these people and, and share Christ with them. So the key is to be on fire. And then you can lead the thirsty to the water, the, the eternal water, right? By, by prayer, by Scripture. Okay? So let's pray. So Lord, help us in our, our daily walk with You. So important, our daily walk with You. And, and those that, that might be struggling today, maybe not on fire like they feel like they should, maybe you were speaking to that, they need to be on fire, Lord. Right now you see the heart. Would you reach out to them in that situation and would you fill them afresh with your Spirit? Would you light the fire inside of us and, and cause that to, to burn bright? And so help us, Lord. Uh, I need help with that. Uh, the busyness of life um, is also a quenching effect on, on the fire. And, and my fire starts to go out. And Lord, I, I need you. And so just be with us today as we go out. And, and uh, let us feel your presence, Lord. Let us, let us turn to you and give you our attention and hear you speak to us. And so I pray for your people. You bless them and keep them and watch over them and, and the children. Lord. I pray in Jesus' name.